Good morning, everyone. Um, hope you all had a good day. First day at, at Def Mountain, Thailand here. Um, it was great to see a lot of good speakers around. Um, and I'm looking to network uh, with them after this talk. Um, honored to be part of this um, tech festival. And I hope I can share something useful for you all listening in. Today, my talk's name is Otel Otel. Um, any idea what is it, it is about? Well, well, we'll we'll find it out, right? We'll find out together what I'm gonna, I'm going to tell you about. Um, my name is Vartev Smith Hong. Um, you guys can call me Philip. I'm a tech specialist at Become Online. Um, we are building um, a crypto exchange, and we are the biggest exchange crypto exchange in Thailand. Um, when I'm free or I'm not doing my my office work, I am contributing to open source and currently I'm actively contributing to Yuan Finance is a DeFi protocol. So uh, a little bit about my background. Um, I was an ex-engineer at Agoda. I'm an ex-engineer at Agoda. Um, after working at Agoda for a while, I, I moved on to work in a remote company, um, Silicon Valley Insight. It's a consultant development company um, which work with clients like Snoop Dogg um, and currently um, I moved on to work at Bitcup Online and I think the role here is and, and, the, and the opportunity to grow here is, is really um, fascinating. Since I started programming until today the software world has changed and it has been keep changing right so software development has continued to change and um, the reason to that for that I see is because open source software and public cloud providers, they allow us to actually change the way we do things, right? Because of them, we, we are able to not write 100% of our code, right? We can actually just, it's so easy to build and deploy code these days because you don't have to build your own, you don't have to like provision your, your, your servers, right? You don't have to build all the custom logic yourself, right? Today we have some, some code, no code solutions, right? Let's say like Firebase, Auth0, Digital Ocean, Lambda function, right? I mean, uh, uh, when, the, when Lambda first came out, I, I was really um, excited because now I could just write a function, I could just deploy a simple function, right? You don't have to write any other things anymore. You have to think about deployment and you pay only per use, right? So it, I think it really benefits developers, right? So, I mean, all this means that actually you can build an app and you deploy an app from scratch very simple these days, right? Sometimes it'll take much shorter time these days than, than it used to before, right? So, I have a question for you guys, right? So, what was the shortest amount of time taken to build a software, right? I'll give you some time to think, right? So, it could be, um, let's say, in, in time period, right? So, what was, the, what was the shortest amount of time taken to build a software? So for me, I think a couple of days, I think I've built like small, small apps that I use my personally, I've used like small apps and it took me a couple of days to build that. So another question I would ask you guys listening in is what was the longest software you've ever operated, right? So it's, it's the time you spend after building the software and actually like operating it and using it online, right? So this could be some months, some days, all right? Specific time, right? I think you, sh you come up with a number and you let me know in the comments or anywhere. It's just write it down, right? Just keep in mind of these numbers you're, you're thinking of. So, I'm guessing that the number of time, amount of time you spend operating the system, and amount of time building and 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 deploying, right? It's it's the amount of time operating it is much more, right? So I think it's a lot of times more. So let's say. For me, it's like a few days of development, but like months of using, right? So I guess like for, for enterprises, it's years of building and, and decades of using, right? Or, or, or technologies like that, right? So, I mean, um, the amount of time taking, taking to build and, and deploy things is much lesser than how much time it takes to maintain things, right? So what my point here is that deploying apps is not equal to operate, right? Just because it's easy to deploy apps doesn't mean it's got easier to operate or maintain them. Because applications also have become more complex and more distributed. Seeing the big picture 
as well as pinpointing exactly where the problem is, is getting much more difficult. But some of things have changed, right? We some of things haven't changed. So we still need to understand application performance from user's point of view, right? Understanding um, exactly um, what, what the user is facing, right? What, what the users are using from our system, right? So maybe going through the app, going to the website, we need to know what the users are doing. We also need to understand how much resources are being consumed, right? So through the transactions, right? Through user transactions, right? Going through our system, we need to also know what are they actually using, right? So are they using the servers? Are they using the database? How much are they using, right? So these are stuff we still need to know, right, as an operator. We still need observability. We need still need to be able to observe what's going on in our systems, in our applications. My goal today is to provide you some understanding of observability and then talk through three pillars and single bit paradigms of observability and also go through open telemetry. I hope that you learned something from today's talk. So what are we exactly observing, right? Do you guys have any answers? Um, what are we exactly observing, right? As, as a guy who, who build a software and then what are we doing next, right? What are we actually observing from our systems, right? So the first thing I would think of is transactions, right? So understanding the actions that the users are taking and then understanding the actions that the distributed system needs to execute for the, for the service to do something useful. So um, here I have an example where a user wants to check out from a website, right? So he, he goes to the website, he clicks on some buttons, and then he, it, the request goes through some back end for front end, and then it goes through auth service, and then it goes through customer service, and go to cart service, order service, right? So a lot of microservices in a distributed system, right? So how do we keep track of this, right? How do we keep track of which, which services are calling what? Um, what are the bottlenecks are, right? So that's part of a transaction. Understanding transactions are important. So here, the whole tra I'm not meaning only just a database transaction. I'm meaning the whole system transaction, right? So the, when a user transacts with us, they're using some business logic, right? So I'm doing some, when then we do some operations on top of it, right? So sending some requests here and there, getting some response and stuff like that. So that's a transaction for us right now. Next one that we, we, we need to observe is transactions. Um, my, my bad. Resources, so transactions use up resources, right? So, so let's say we have transactions coming in, right? And then all these transactions use up resources. So let's say web services that we're getting in, we're getting only so many concurrent requests until we, we face issues, right? So my, the servers might fail or we, we cannot handle more um, requests coming in, right? So we need to be able to keep track of how much our requests are coming, how much requests are coming in, how much requests do we have left, um, the CPU usage and stuff like that. Right? We need to keep track of those sort of stuff of our resources. And also talking about, even though we scale the resources up, right, we still have to um, observe our database, right? So database connections, database usage, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of problems that can happen if you don't keep track of, of, of observing these database, right? We could face uh, database lock issues, right? Um, database could be locked, right? Some, some requests might be trying to read it and some requests might be locking it, right? So I think understanding what's going on and in, in after you deploy it, I think that's also really important, right? So these two things are really important, tr transactions and resources. So let's say a real world scenario, right? So a knock team comes in, right? Uh, uh, someone who actually, like does like 24 hours monitoring for us, right? He comes in and he's like, um, users are not able to check out like disaster right, on production. Um, urgent fix is required, what to do? I mean, as an engineer, as an operator, there's actually not much you can do at that moment, right? But then there's actually two things we can do, right? And it, it, two things comes from what we talked about, transactions and, and, and resources. So we either, we either modify a transaction, so we change the business logic, right? So we, we improve, do some optimization in the code, and, and we try to solve the problem, or, or we can up our resources, right? So we either we swap our resources in, or increase our resources, or solve the resource problem, right? So either two things, right? Solving transactions or for solving resources. But of course, when you actually do this in, in, in the real life situation, it's much more complicated. But generally, it falls down in two domains. Next one I want to talk about is three pillars of observability, right? So 
I, I, I intentionally put in like an old Greece look, Greek looking like pillars, right? Because it's actually very old par paradigm. I mean, it's something that a lot of engineers, like old school engineers would know about, but it's not for today. It's not for the modern world applications anymore. At least that's what my belief is. So uh, the three pillars are logging. So logging is actually just recording the individual events that make up a transaction, right? So basically events coming out of it, right? With, with timestamps. Um, metrics is actually a recording of individual events coming in, right? So it's actually ag aggregation or, or a sampling, right? It's pretty much ag aggregation of multiple um, individual events, right? Um, tracing is actually measuring the latency of operations, right? So we're actually tracing like operations, right? So let's say we have like 10 operations for this request, right? We want to understand each of them, right? So that's actually tracing through our request. And that will help us identify performance and bottlenecks issues. So, so this is an example, right? An example for, for what I mean by three pillars and how does it, it, does, it does not fit the modern world anymore. So let's say the person A, right? We, we build an app and then the person A comes in and he's like, I, I, I want to understand what's going on in my application. So I'm going to put some logs, right? So he's putting some random logs in and he's using his own tool, right? He sends it to his Slack channel, right? Like, oh, I want to know what is happening to my system. So he's sending his messages. He's sending his logs through the Slack channel. It's like different flow, right? Person B comes in, he's like, he's probably this infrastructure guy, right? He's like, DevOps guy, right? He's like, I want to monitor exactly what's happening to my resources, and I also want to capture metrics, right? So I want to build some, some, some monitoring on top of it, right? Um, but I, I, I don't understand what the person A is doing, and I don't want to understand it, right? So I'm going to build my own tool, and I'm going to use my own tool to monitor my own resources, right? So domain, right? It's domain, right? So it's like a three pillar, and he's standing, he's building the next pillar. A third person comes in, he's like, um, I want to find the bottlenecks of my code, right? So when you want to find the bottlenecks of your code, the person A didn't think about that. So he still has to be able to build a new one, right? So it's three different domains, right? So the understanding is they're trying to solve similar things, but because it's three pillars and it's three domains, they're actually trying to find something different, right? So what happens in production, right? So let's say knock team is like, there's a bug or the system failed, something really went wrong, right? On production. How, how do we solve this problem, right? Like this, the three guys come into the room, right? And then he, I'm sitting there, I'm listening to these three guys and they're telling me how to solve this problem, right? So the person gives me one link and the second person gives me another link. So the third person gives me another link. I take these three links together. I open them in three different tabs. I'm trying to correlate them to using time, right? So I'm, I'm finding a first timestamp and a first thing, maybe find some attributes in the first tab. And I'm, I'm then copying it and finding it in the next tab and then copying it and finding a third tab, right? So I'm not able to automatically do this and, and I have to do this manually, right? Because it's three tabs and three different systems, right? And I need all three to actually monitor my, or, or observe my, my system, right? So that's, that's not fun, right? That's horrible. That's not fun at all. I mean, I don't want to do this, right? I don't want to open three tabs and all of the data is not connected. So what if we could identify how, not what is changing? So what my, my point here is that when we have three logs, we know what is changing, right? But we don't know how this pillar and this pillar is connected, right? We don't, we don't know exactly how that, how that works. We don't know. We know what is changing, right? We see spikes, we see um, bad logs, we see um, bad traces, right? But we don't know how is it affecting each other at all. So this is a more modern paradigm, single braid paradigm, right? So in this case, the logs are linked with the transactions, metrics are linked with the logs, and each data point is linked with resources. What, what would happen if we all link these all things together? We will have a tran transversible graph containing all the data. So this is, this is actually really important, right? So we are building, to, to become a single braid, right? All data that we talked about in three tabs, right? It has to be all connected, right? So when there's an issue in production, there's only one thing, one place to go, and there's one, 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 one dashboard you should see, right? So there's this value in that, right? Value in structured data, right? The value is that we are able to build better tools. To build better tools, we need better data. So having a single braid will, will allow us to build better tools. Um, also, whatever we use telemetry, right? We need we must we has every any tool that we use, right? Must provide two qualities, right? To support 
high quality automated analysis. I'll talk about automated analysis later on in the slides, but to be able to automate the analysis, right? To be able to automate things, right? We need to be able to make sure that there's proper indexing done on all the data points. And also it has to have well-defined keys and values, right? So there's a set of standards that, that, that people are following, right? To create this, this transversible graph with all the data points connected, right? So it structured data of, of things, has to, it has to be something around this, right? So this attributes, right? Um, attributes which is basically key values of all the data structures, right? So there needs to be some set of um, convention, a way, a way to do things. Um, so here we have HTTP request, right? So this is a set of attributes we would have to define and make it a standard, right? For all the data points that go through that use HTTP, right? So here we have HTTP method, we have HTTP target, we have uh, HTTP host, HTTP schema, we have HTTP status code, right? So for all HTTP events, we want to have these values. So that's a standard we must have, right? To build this structured data. Next one is events. So we need to understand what an event is, right? What, what, what is an event? So an event is actually a timestamp with a set of attributes, right? This could be any attributes. And then there's two types of, 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 of context in this events, right? So there's static context, right? Static context is all about the resources. So this is only decided when the program starts, right? So let's say I'm, I'm, I'm trying to send events from a service, right? So I'm having this static context from my service. Then I also need dynamic context, right? Dynamic context is basically what we talked about, right? So incoming requests, outgoing requests, the operations, right? It's related to more transactions, more towards transactions than resources. Static is more towards resources. So here I have an example, um, basically, basically like a bunch of attributes and timestamp and a message, right? We also need to structure our resources, right? So we have to structure the static context that we talked about, right? Service name, service ID, and everything, right? But we also need to do that, not just for um, the resource, for, for servers, right? We need to do that for database. We need to do that for client front end. We need to do that for, um, let's say, um, a lot of things, right? In, uh, let's say cache, radius, elastic search. We have to set like a lot of standard, right? To, to build this structured data for all these types of, 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 of infrastructure. So resources could be anything, right? Servers, containers, deployments, regions, a lot of things that are, it's all about infrastructure here, right? We also need to be able to define spans, right? Uh, observing transactions, right? We need to be able to understand this, what dynamic context we want to give it, right? So let's say we have, like, let's go back to the checkout example, right? We have one where we have a bunch of requests, bunch of operations we do from a single request. Um, we need to understand each of them, each, each operation, right, each span. So there needs to be a start time, there needs to be end time, right? So each of the operations needs a start time and end time to, to explain what's happening in that operation in that, in that span. We also need to do tracing, right? I mean, this modern, modern applications need tracing, right? I mean, a lot of people say this, like logging, but only better. Um, it's actually, a trace is actually a graph with organized spans, right? So we are talking about, remember we talked about the spans and now, now we, we put the spans together, it, we create, we create a, a trace. And it's a, so they, all the spans are associated with resources, so traces also would know exactly what's going on, right? So it's actually a graph of all the spans. So here I have a diagram where we, we go to a get request and we try to cache and then we go carry the database, right? Metrics, right? We also have a standard for metrics, right? So we want aggregated metrics events, right? So we might want to visualize this to a gauge or a histogram or a count or a threshold, and then we build monitoring on top of it, right? So all this data has to be standardized in order for us to build structured data. So here comes, so, I, I, so the reason we need to do structured data is we, we will be able to do this. We will be able to find automated correlation and analysis. So some examples for this, and try to understand what, 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 what value of structured data is, right? Is that, let, let, let's say there's some issue on, on, on some services, right? And then we go to the war room, right? And then we, we, we have a list of, of correlations we see, right? Okay, like this extreme, I have, I, here, I have here three examples. Extreme latency in highly correlated Kafka node six, right? So it means something really went wrong. Um, there's, there's a correlation, right? So we have extreme latency because there's value, um, there's structured data between resources and, and also transactions and tracing, right? So these, because of structured data, 
systems are like tools, right, are able to use this structured data to come up with correlations, right? Because if it's unstructured, then they cannot come up with this. Because it's structured, they can come up with this, right? So increased error rate is highly correlated with version 1.3. There's probably a spike, and that, that's something you do with the resources, right? Um, traffic spike, we're using a for them, right? This is a bad example, but I don't do this. Um, but, yeah, so these are examples what, what, what tools, the tools can use our value um, structured data to do. So let's say during war room, right? Yeah. Intuition is, is a problem, right? So um, sometimes what we happen, what happens in the war room is that you, you go into a war room, right? And then um, companies are getting bigger, right? So let's say um, we get we get like 20 people coming in, right? And then the system is there's 50 microservices, right? So let's say there's 50 microservices, there's 20 engineers there. Not, not everyone knows everything, right? And then there's one guy who says, I have a gut feeling like, the problem is in this service, right? But that actually doesn't save anyone any time, right? Because intuition is mostly wrong. It's mostly wrong in most of the cases, uh, unless your company is still small, right? If the company is big already, intuition is wrong, right? No one, not a single person can actually tell what's wrong with the whole system, right? If there's a problem with the system, it's actually get, the likelihood of him getting right is, is really low. So intuition doesn't scale well, it's mostly misguided, and not everyone has the same understanding, right? So there's missing understanding between the people in the room. Using automated correlation detection, actually what machines would be able to detect potential problems, right? So they could list out the potential hypothesis for us, and then we go through it, we test each hypothesis, right? So let's say, like, like the last slide I talked about the examples, let's say we go through all of them, right, and see exactly which one actually is we want to solve and which one do you think um, is actually a real problem, right? So how do we do this, right? How do we do all, all the things I've, talk, I've been talking about? Um, open telemetry. I think this is a good solution. I, I, I suggest you guys to, to try this out. But, so open telemetry is a set of API, SDKs, toolings, and integrations that are designed for the creation of management of telemetry data, such as traces, metrics, and logs, right? So it's pretty much, they build SDK APIs and, and conventions and toolings and integrations, right? So this is just the definition, right? I, I, want, I want you guys to see exactly the benefits of it, right? If we, if we do this, what happens is they provide us a single collector. So this collector binary allows us to collect data, and it is also vendor agnostic. It means that it doesn't depend on a language or it doesn't depend on a on a vendor, right? So it, bigger it is, there's permissions, and it's, um, there's a lot of, of vendor stuff, right? We don't want to pay anyone to do this for us. We want to use something which is you can connect to ad, ad, any other vendor, right? So it's vendor agnostic, right? And um, you're able to connect this using a collector binary, and you have full control of data, right? So. What happens is when you collect data through the collector, you connect to your applications, and, and you can send it to multiple um, multiple destinations parallelly. Um, so let's say we connect some 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 data right through the through open telemetry, and this open telemetry can dispatch it to other backends, right? So let's say Jaeger or Prometheus or anywhere else, right? So it it distributes that information for you parallelly. It also provides us with open standard configurations, right? So basically, set of standards of attributes and metrics that we talked about, right? All the things that we talked about for structured data, they provide that for us. So just to just to make sure that we don't misunderstand, open telemetry is not an observability backend like Jaeger or Prometheus, right? It's not the same, right? OTL is, is a little bit different. So they just set a standard for us, right? API standards and everything, right? And then they have a collector for us which collects all these data in that standard. So it's a single braid, right? So when a single braid happens, when you, you can see a single braid because all the data is, is sent to, all connected by telemetry, and they're all sent to the same database to be analyzed, and this, is, this will be the next generation right, of, of observability to where we have standards and we can build things on top of this. So here I have um, an overall architecture overview, right? So here we have an application. Um, on, on the top left, um, we have we have an application. Application has OTIL library. So, and this OTIL library, um, this OTIL library sends 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 um, metrics, sends metrics, sends traces, and sends logs to the collector, the agent, agent running sidecar or, or 
any any way you want. So so it's running next to the application and the auto library sends information to the collector. Collector can dispatch it to multiple backends. Here we, we don't mean backend servers, we mean backend tool chains, right? So it could be Jaeger, it could be Datadog, it could be um, whatever you like, right? A lot of a lot of these vendors actually and these backends provide um, integrations with Open Telemetry already. So and there's another way, um, which is the where we have applications and we have collector as an agent and the agent sends it. So every application in in the, in the big picture, right? Every every application will have auto library and the auto library will send it to the collector, which is an agent, and the agent will pass it to a, a service uh, collector. So you actually in in. So there's two of them, right? There's the first one and the second one, right? So there's actually two in the line in the middle. So there's two examples linking each other. So you could go through an agent straight directly to the backend, or you could go to agent and then you could go to a service, right? So there's two types of it, right? So there's two modern, like uh, or major ways to do things. Um, for 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 starters, right? For new projects, right? We can actually start off straight up with putting an agent there and then connecting to the backend, right? Um, but for, for people who are actually using it already and 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 and, and have like backends already, right? So they have um, Jaeger already, they, they're already putting Jaeger in the code, right? So actually what collector is actually able to do is actually able to receive this Jaeger data, Jaeger format, right? And able to send it to the collector as well. So we, we, we have a way to configure like for, for all people, right? for people who haven't fully migrated, for people who haven't fully migrated to Otel, right? They can actually use Jaeger format and then pass through through the collectors. So understanding what collector actually is, right? So collector here, um, we have OTLP, which is Open Telemetry Protocol, right? So these are the standards that the open, open Telemetry sets. It sends to the receivers, which is the left long line. Um, once the receivers get this data, they can able to filter, they can add attributes, they can remove attributes, they can process this data, and then they can export it in, in, in three formats. In OTLP, we can they can export it as Jaeger, they can export it as Prometheus, right? But also, receivers can also receive Jaeger data. They can also receive Prometheus data. And they, once they receive these data, they, they, can, they can also receive it and they can also process it. Just we need to be able to configure what, what type of, what, what format, what standard are we receiving this data from, right? So, uh, I will be going to some, some demos and I, I hope that it helps you understand OTIL more. Um, I'm gonna start off with um, going through some code. So this is the code I, I pull off from, um, from OTIL. Um, so I, I pulled this code off from OTIL. Um, so it's a, it's a demo project, right? So here we have client and we have server, and which is like two, two services written in Golang, right? Um, and we have um, Prometheus set up, we have um, some configuration for Prometheus, we have configuration, configuration for OTL collector, and we have two services. So I'm gonna start off with just understanding the co complete picture overall. So we have this Docker Compose, which will run all the services for us. So we're running a Jaeger image, we're running a Zipkin, and then we're also running a collector demo client, demo server, and Prometheus, right? So, mid, so all these are, are, are observability tools, and this is the collector that Otel set the standard off, right? So let's see here that we are actually in our code, on our code base, we're actually only connecting to Otel, right? If you can see here that we're only importing Otel stuff, like Otel um, metrics, Otel exporters, Otel resources, Otel configuration, Otel traces, we're only using these stuff. So what happens here is we, um, let's say we are on the server, right? So we, we are actually in, in taking in like, um, we're taking in the function and we are spending some random sleep time and then we're able to extract some, some span context, right? For, to do tracing. And we are able to, we're able to um, handle some incoming requests, right? This is from the server side and it does some metric collection as well. For the client side, we have a make request so we're trying to make a request to the server and it's injecting some transport layer from, from auto telemetry. It will make context with make requests with context. 
it's, it's okay to ignore the, the, the syntax and everything, the details, but I want to understand the, the general concept, right? So client is making a request to the server and it's sending some, some headers and, and some context, right? And then the server is receiving it and also extracting some context from it and handling a function here. So it's extracting some, some context from it, right? And then it's doing, yep. So it's, it's actually, there's a wrap handler, right? So it's actually trying to um, extract some context from the request. So one, once we do this, what happens is I'm, I'm going to try running. I'm going to try running um, this Docker um, this Docker um, image up, and what, what what will happen in this example would be this. So I'm going to be running that, and I'm running that. So here we have three screens. I'm going to add in three three UIs, right? So we connect only with Open Telemetry, but our end result is actually three applications, right? So we have here, um, so we can find spaces, right? And then we can list out. Okay, so this is all incoming requests, right? So this is all data that's open telemetry, which exported to Jaeger, right? So this, so we the app only integrated with open telemetry, but but Jaeger and, and, and here you will see Zipkin as well. We are able to run a query and we can actually filter out by the resource, right? So demo client. So we're able to do things like that. Um, and also see the dependencies and traces, right? That's, that's also really nice. And all the requests coming in. This is, if you guys want to know about Zipkin more, that's probably another session. But, so we have also have Prometheus, right? We can actually see exactly um, some, some metrics that we collected, right? So we're going to see like um, request count, right? O over the two days, right? So it's some time, right? So, so we can go like smaller time so that we can see exactly. So like every last five minutes, right? So the number of requests has been going up, right? This is a total count. We can actually split this into the minutes as well. Um, so he here we have, um, we can also see system architecture here, a graph with all our, our applications. So how does this actually work in, in, in a little bit technical, right? So we, we go back to the code and we see open telemetry collector so here, collector and this is an is an application running, right? So service so running. So it receives an OTLP um, protocol event or a message, right? A request in gRPC, right? So what happens here is it receives this, and it exports to Prometheus in, in this in this port. So we from the application, it's just sending one type, right? So sending just OTLP, and then the, this exporter is helping us export it to Prometheus. Exporting into Zipkin, exporting into Jaeger, right? So all, all these, all these, um, all these endpoints are something we, we open during Docker Compose, right? So we are what we can also set up. What are we sending, right? So we are exporting traces to um, Zipkin, we're sending it to Jaeger, and we're sending metrics only to Prometheus. So this is how how we we, we can structure um, um, our collector, right? So here we can actually receive more. So we can actually receive Jaeger type as well for people who haven't who don't want to fully migrate. To, to, to who, who haven't fully migrated their app, right? So they can actually just use, if the, if the app is connected directly to Jaeger, then you can actually change this and you can add some protocols of Jaeger and, and other, other stuff as well. Like you can see here that it's, it's actually that really easy for us to actually start migrating from, from, from a specific vendor to, to something OTLP, right? Well, well, that's all I have for today. Um, I'm open for Q and A. Um, it can be about anything, um, from 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 what I do and from from to um, tracing or or, or um, open telemetry in general. So I'm open for Q and A. Um, I'll be waiting for questions. Anyone has any questions? Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that we don't have any questions and um, I want to thank you all for, for listening in and um, if you have any questions or you want to know more about me, you can, this is my email and um, thank you for listening in.